again for this morning. Thank you for that incredible grace that you do show to each and every one of us. Thank you for your spirit and your presence with us each and every moment of every day. And Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we have together and to worship and to praise you, to open your word, have you speak truth into our hearts. So I pray that, Lord, we would have hearts that are open, ears that are attentive, and that you would be with your servant Mark here and just, Lord, use him to speak and to proclaim your truth. Give him peace, give him your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so it was that and not your pastor telling you that he solicited a prostitute last week. So. Any of you weren't here, go online and watch it. Kent, get ready for a lot of hits on the website. No, it's, it's my pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'd just like to start with this uh, story for you. Uh, a couple of years ago, Aaron and I went uh, with Pastor Mike and Joy. <laughs> She's laughing already. <laughs> to an E-Free Church conference. Uh, we were heading up, riding together. It was in the cities. And Joy let us know that Mike made all the arrangements for the, uh, where we were staying. If you know anything about Aaron and I, comfort is rather important. And so, um, I didn't have any major reason not to trust Mike, except for a honeymoon story about him getting the hotel room, and the room would, was less than desirable, would you say. That, and I also know how Mike likes to get a good deal. So, anyway, so we're driving along, and uh, we show up at our destination, the Skyline Motel. We pull into the parking lot, and <laughs> Aaron and I immediately basically go into shock. The place is scary. The outside was dirty. The desk had bulletproof glass. There might have been an hourly rate. I'm not sure. There was no one around, and Aaron and I were freaking out a little bit. So we let Mike know that this place surely had bed bugs, and that it was a nationwide epidemic. That's important. I told Mike we would do anything to go to a different hotel room, basically pay anything. I tried to find a picture online so you could see this beautiful establishment, but I don't think it's there anymore. We, I went to Google Earth and had the address and it was just a field, so. <laughs> anyway, there was, uh, I did find some reviews from when it was there, and one said, run as fast as you can away from this establishment. <laughs> so, there was that, and then the other one was just labeled Dirty Dirt Dirt. <laughs> so, <laughs> Let's just say the hospitality at that place would have been poor at best. And then after um, they played along a while and then laughed at us for quite a while, they uh, brought us to the um, other hotel that they actually had picked out. And it, and it, 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 was, it was very nice. So you see that that's why Joy was laughing at the very beginning. It had a great place to sit and relax, and I'm a big, I love cookies, and they had co fresh cookies in when you walked in, and then even we were playing cards and hanging out, and they made some cookies for us and brought, us, brought it out to us, and so it was just a really nice place to stay. Cookies are a big thing to me. The hospitality we encountered at these two places was very different. Uh, the same is the case for our Bible passage today. Jesus' presence um, among two people whose hospitality towards him was very different. If you would please open your Bible with me to Luke chapter 7, uh, verses 36 through 50. We'll slowly work through this, uh, these verses here today. I'll just start with verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So, obviously a Pharisee asked Jesus to come to his house for a dinner party, basically. And it was Jesus and then probably some other Pharisees there with him. And the label Pharisee is rather important to the passage. It's given even before the man's name. The term Pharisee meant the separated ones. The Pharisees were solidly devoted to daily application and observance of the Mosaic Law. 
they were, you've heard Pastor Ray say before, they were so careful to avoid breaking the Ten Commandments that they basically built a fence around them. They added 248 commandments and 365 prohibitions to ensure that they not, didn't even approach the Ten. A Pharisee in the mind of the people of the period was far different than what Ivo was thought. And I learned that this last uh, couple of weeks. The Jewish people actually really looked up to and respected the Pharisees. Their popularity is said to have been so high that they were listened to even um, when they criticized the king or the high priest. People would follow them over the others. Most people would have considered this dinner party quite, with the Pharisees to be quite an honor. Now, what, the, what was the Pharisees' motivation for inviting Jesus? Perhaps it was just curiosity. They had seen him perform miracles and had heard his teaching, which they, was unlike anything they had ever heard. So they just may have wanted to investigate themselves. But most likely, though, their intentions were not good. Most of them did not believe he was who he said he was. And Jesus had had some harsh criticism for the Pharisees in regards to their hypocrisy and self-righteous attitude. Their hostility towards Christ and his criticism towards them is seen 28 times in the book of Luke. So I'm sure the scenario wasn't much different. He was probably invited to see if they could trap him or ensnare him in something that they could use against him later. Another way we might know that it, his, their intentions towards him probably weren't that well is how he was treated on his arrival to the house, or as they call it, given the Skyline Motel treatment. In the Eastern home, it was custom for the host to greet each guest with a kiss on the cheek and then have water available or slaves available to wash off the people's feet. And then they'd pour sweet olive oil over the head to soften their parched skin. This was not done for Jesus. And one of the commentators I read even went as far as to say it was done for everybody else but Jesus. I don't know if we could say that for sure. But we can know the Pharisees' motivations was most likely unpure just by that response. And of course, I said before, the other guest at the dinner party was Jesus. As usually was the case, Jesus took the time to spend with all different kinds of people, even though this was the skyline hospitality. And knowing their motives were unpure, he went anyway, and he had something he wanted to teach them. Let's go on to verse 37. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned, learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. Now there's a few different instances throughout the New Testament of Jesus being anointed by a woman. Some have speculated that this woman is Mary Magdalene, but that is very unlikely based on the place and time and the fact that it was at Simon the Pharisee's house. We are never given this woman's name only that she was a sinner. The Arabic word for sinner here signified she was a prostitute. There was no doubt she was a sinner and everyone in town knew her and that profession. And when she learned he was at the Pharisee's house, she had to go to him. Jesus had a profound effect on this woman. She had either heard of his reputation or she had been seen him heal others or hear, heard him teach out in public. Whatever the reason, she had to go to him. She obviously didn't care where she had to go to see him either. Knowing these people in this place would look down on her and condemn her. She went anyway. This woman is desperate for him, and she did whatever it took to see him. Verse 38. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed him with ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, taking the place of a servant. She also probably took that place feeling unworthy to come before him. Any other way based on his life, her life. She went beyond the servant's duty of washing the feet with water. She washed them with her tears and dried them with her air, hair. She even kissed his feet. Now that's love and demo devotion because I don't really care for feet as weird as that sounds, but kissing his feet, that was, I mean, that's love. Now, um, verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this, if this man were a prophet, 
he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. The Pharisee determines that Jesus was not a prophet, because which many, many were claiming and therefore proving he is not worthy of following or listening to. He makes this claim because Jesus does not seemingly know the true character of the woman. If he did, he would denounce her as a sinner and forbid her to touch her, because the touch from a woman of this kind would make him unclean. Verse 40, And Jesus answering said to Simon, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. This is the first time we're given the Pharisee's name, Simon. When you look at the heading in your Bible for the passage, mine said, a sinful woman forgiven, which is true and very important for you and I. But I believe this passage seems to be more about Simon than the woman. We are told his name. Jesus spends most of his time and attention on him and his attitude. So he now tells them this parable, verses 41 and 42. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denari, denari and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? This, this parable was given to Simon to see the error of his ways in judging the sinful woman, but it is also a very clear picture to us of the gospel message. The debt in that parable is sin. Simon, the woman, and you and I have all accumulated debt in our lives. This is not good debt, as some people would say about your home mortgage. This is a vile, gross, ugly debt. This is the debt like owing money to a loan shark or not paying your taxes or being uh, maxed out in many credit cards. This is put you in jail and throw away the key debt. God is the money in this parable, and he loves and longs to have a relationship with his debtors, but he cannot. Only those with a balance sheet of zero can have a relationship with him. Everyone throughout time, from Adam and Eve until now, has debt. We are all in the same boat. We all have it because all have sinned. We accumulate debt from a very young age, and it's just part of who we are when we're born. No one needs to teach us to be selfish. We just are. No one needs to teach us to stride out in anger. We just do. No one teaches us to want something, something someone else has. We just do. And those sins are all debt. And that debt continues to grow over time and continues to cause pain and heartache in our lives. So we search for all sorts of ways to try and pay it off. We, uh, to get back in those good graces of the lender, we do good things. We, we help others. We try to think positively about our lives. We work hard. We get good grades. We give money to worthy causes. We go to church. We volunteer. We just try not to do bad things to pay off this debt that we owe. It doesn't help. And even after all those things, our debt still continues to grow. And one of the worst things is, is that we deserve it. No one else accumulated that debt. It was all our own doing. In the old days, they had debtors prisons for people like this, and this is what we deserve. With no chance for parole. But God made a way through his awesome love and amazing grace. gospel such great effects Jesus came to the earth and lived among us but he did not accumulate debt Joy owes me 25 bucks too or 20 20 for crying Ugh. then Je Jesus we know Jesus willingly went to the cross and God placed all of our debt on him and he suffered and died and this act of love grace and mercy canceled that debt with God no matter how big or small it was God took the ledger of our life and zeroed it out he justified us he cleansed us he freed us from that prison of debt and sin and he made us right with God and gave us access to the riches of God's grace for all time and it's an awesome thing when people truly understand the grace of God but it appears that Simon cannot 
I think Jesus still even throws Simon a bone, so to speak, by telling the parable with one person, person owing much and another owing little. We know it, that Simon saw himself as the one owing little, if he saw any debt at all in his life. This begs the question, do some people have greater or lesser amounts of sin? I really don't know, and sin is sin, and it doesn't matter how much or how little we have. Even one keeps us from being with God. Also, this might not be how much sin they actually have, but how much sin they can see in their own lives. And si Simon saw very little, and the woman saw a lot. On to verse 43, where Simon answers the question Jesus asked him about uh, which one would love him more. And he says, the one I suppose for whom, I, whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Have you ever known the answer to a question someone asked you but haven't wanted to give it because you didn't want to give the asker the answer they were looking for? I believe this is how Simon feels. The suppose gives it away. The wording Jesus used to answer back to Simon I think is rather poignant. He says, you have judged rightly. That is all Simon had done to him and the woman since they had arrived at the dinner party. Now Jesus rightly judged Simon's actions by comparing his to the woman. Verses 44 through 48. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now God gave grace both to Simon and the woman. To Simon, he, he gave grace just by showing up and accepting his invitation to his house and loved him enough to want to teach him something. To the woman, he shows her grace by sending, not sending her away when she comes to him and obviously forgiving her sins. Jesus compares Simon's behavior to the woman's, showing their very dis different responses to the grace he's shown them. I think the question that he gives to Simon in verse 44 shows how Simon is responding to Jesus' grace. Jesus asked him, do you see this woman? He couldn't. He couldn't see her. He could not see her with the love and grace that Jesus saw her. He only saw her through the lens of the law and through the eyes of the religious system. And through those eyes, he saw her correctly. She was guilty. The law is final and unbending. The law is there to show us our sin. She had lived a sinful life and had not done what the law required. She deserved judgment, wouldn't put up against the law. Simon judged her, and he would not show her grace because in his mind, she didn't deserve it. He also judged Jesus being a prophet based on how he responded to the woman. He was willing to be, since he was willing to be unclean by her touch. The law, according to Simon, deemed Jesus guilty as well. He also responded to God's grace with a self-righteous attitude. Jesus compares the woman's treatment of him to Simon's as he entered the house. Simon's skyline motel treatment showed that he thought he was better than both of them and therefore would not even give him the common courtesy greeting to Christ. His self-righteousness also helps him to completely miss his need for a savior, his need to be forgiven. He feels he's been made righteous by the religious works, rules, and rituals he follows. And he would not be able to see the woman as Jesus are until he could see Jesus for who, who he truly was. The woman on the only hand could only see Jesus. She responded to his great with grace with desperate abandon. That is why she did not care about going into his ho a house where she wasn't welcomed in. That is why she did not mind if the Pharisees judged her for her life and how she cared for Jesus. That is why she did not care about becoming a servant and washing his feet. She did see Jesus for who he was. She also responded to his grace with desperate need. She knows she is a vile sinner. She sees her many sins and knows she can do nothing of herself to save her. She is greatly aware of her great need for forgiveness. She knew who he was and knew what he could and would do to forgive her sins. And this leads to her biggest response of his grace given to her, and that was love and worship. 
She washes her feet, his feet with her tears and wipes them off with her hair. She kisses his feet over and over. This is worship to Jesus, the savior of her soul, the one who can make her righteous. She is thankful and, and amazed at what he's done. Verse 49, then those who were at the table with him began to say to themselves, among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus told the woman that her sins were forgiven for her benefit, of course, but also for the benefit of those sitting around the table, so that they may see that, a, that he was a prophet, and he did know her many sins and who she was. He is also showing that he is much more than a prophet, but God himself. God is the only one that can forgive sins. Now Jesus turns to the woman in verse 50 and says, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Faith requires two things. Pretty simply, knowing I can't and knowing only God can. This woman knew it before she even came to see him. She had heard him preaching the good news and had to see him. She knew he would forgive her sins. She knew he would save her. That is why she worshipped him even before he said anything to her. So as you've, read, as you've read this passage before or heard it today, who do you identify with, Simon the Pharisee or the woman? My guess would be probably neither, really. You really feel sorry for the woman who is a sinner and are excited about Jesus showing her compassion and love, but you're not in her position, so you maybe can't totally relate to her. And Simon, he was a Pharisee. How can you relate to him or even like him? I mean, the Pharisees seem to be Jesus' enemy. Whenever I read passages about Pharisees or hear them uh, preached in sermons, I always feel like booing. I mean, look at how judgmental and self-righteous Simon is in the passage. Following the rules and calling out sin were much more important than love and mercy. I hope we don't identify that. So you probably know this, where this is going, but oh, what a glorious shock. When I was reading this passage a little while back, it had a dawn at me how much I am like Simon. A Christian Pharisee. Christian makes it sound better, right? Following the rules set up by the Christian culture was always real important to me. In many areas of my life, I began to see how I carried an attitude of a Pharisee, judgmental, self-righteous, and hypocritical. So how does that happen? How does a Christian become a Pharisee? I believe for those of us who grew up in a Christian home or came to Christ at a young age, we have a greater chance of becoming a Pharisee than maybe those who come later in life to Christ. If grace is not something that we understand very well, it is easy for works to become the standard of how we live. And I did come to Christ at a young age and learned very quickly what was expected of me in the, this Christian environment. We went to church whenever the doors were open, two times on Sunday, once on Wednesday, and whenever there was a special meeting or anything going out, else going on, Bible study, scripture memorization, prayer, were all very important religious duties. You also learned from a young age that being a Christian meant that you were separate from the world. I knew what sin was and what right and wrong word were. I also knew what it looked like. Those that went to church and did what I did were good, and those that didn't were bad. Sin seemed to be broken into, down into categories. Remember, you're younger. The bad ones included sexual sin, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, rated R movies, divorce, liberalism, and rock and roll. The things other people did. The little, one I, the little ones I did, like lying, small theft, cheating at games or in school, hitting your brother or sister were not so bad as long as you followed them up with, with the good. People were also broken into categories. The good people, the saint, who went to church, and uh, they were to be followed and emulated. And then there were the bad people, the sinner, who should be prayed for and witnessed to, but ultimately were tisked for their immoral behavior. And then the third category of the person was the, uh, the one who came to church but had sin in their life, and everyone knew about it, the backslider. And... They were looked down upon because they should know better. They need to just buck up and be better like the rest of us. You see those self-righteous, judgmental attitudes forming in my life? Being in Christian was little about Jesus. 
and a lot about behavior. It was about following the rules laid out by this Christian culture. If you did it well, it meant you were received by others and were a great, good Christian. If you did it poorly, you needed to clean up your act and work harder to be like everyone else. This spilled over into how I felt about God as well. I was new and had been taught that salvation was by faith alone and not by works, and I believed that, and that point was secure. But then after that, it seemed to be all up to me. I thought God would respond to me based on my behavior. If I was, quote, doing the good things a Christian should do, I would be close to him, and he would be happy with me. If I was not doing the good things a Christian should do, God would be angry with me and would be far away. This kind of conditional life puts a huge amount of pressure on a person to act right. If you don't, everyone will be mad at you or disappointed with you. Plus, you would be hurt. You would hurt your witness with, uh, for God, and you wouldn't want to do that. When faced with this, this type of Christianity, your own two types of one, uh, two types of things happen. Either you one run away from it, or you hide who you really are and become a person who is always good on the outside but won't let you anyone see what's going on on the inside. I've been both of those people. First I tr ran and tried not to live under the watchful eye of Christianity that I knew. That was fine for a while, but there was that nagging feeling that I was always hurting God and disappointing everyone else by my bad behavior. My life was like a yo-yo, trying to be good one day and then giving into bad the next until I couldn't take it anymore. So I decided to sum up enough courage to stop doing those bad things and do the good things again. My behavior principle was not just how I thought God saw me, but how other people saw me as well. I wanted them to be pleased with me and my behavior. That was my ultimate motivation. Don't get me wrong, I was a believer in Jesus Christ. And he was my savior. And even through these incorrect views of Christianity and God himself, he continued to pursue me and he worked through me in, even during those times. Now this time, I changed my behavior, it stuck. But my views of God and Christianity, Christianity being all about behavior hadn't changed at all. Then I started to learn about sanctification and holiness. Now this put words to my behavior and gave me even more of a reason to do good things. The more good things I did meant the closer I was to God and was growing in Him, and He would be proud of me and the steps I was making for Him. When I would know I sinned, it was even more devastating because your sin meant your growth, your growth just went backwards, and so you need, you need to work even harder. We all want to be mature, and we all want to see ourselves growing in sanctification. And a lot of the time, how we measure that growth is comparing ourselves to others. It's something we all do. We constantly compare ourselves to others and take inventory of other people, their clothing, their looks, their skills, their attitudes, financial situation, marriage, family, friends, spiritual life. Then we feel good or bad based on how we measure up to how we compare ourselves to them. And comparing is judging. If we see ourselves as better, we are making a negative judgment about someone else. If we see ourselves as worse, we are making a negative judgment about ourselves. Neither is helpful and is oftentimes sinful. If you are mainly focused on behavior, which I usually am, you will judge others based on how they follow the rules made by the Christian culture. Or you make up your own rules you expect people to follow based on your ideas of how a Christian should act. Behavior was my main focus, and I could easily see others' bad behavior, but then I started to struggle to see my own. It was not until God showed me that it's not what you've done, but it's what I have done for you. That's what I saw a different way. The woman from our passage helps us to see that other way. The woman's title was sinner, and she knew it to be true. She did everything else. She did it. Every, I'm sorry. And so did everyone else based on her work. There was no disputing it. The same is true for us, and we should know it to be true as well. Yet many won't believe it. 
We always like to think we are good and better than we are, but we are not and we're actually worse than we think. I did not come to Christ knowing the depth of, depth of my sin. I was only five. I knew Jesus loved me and died for my sin and wanted, I wanted to go to heaven, so I accepted him as my savior. As I grew older, obviously I knew sin. I knew I sinned and saw it hurt myself and others. I just didn't think it was all that bad. I thought being a Christian most of my life and knowing how much God loved me and saw me as his child lessened how much I sinned. You see how Satan twisted that? So, it, so that became a pride in me. It was about two years ago when I first started to truly learn about God's great grace in a whole new way that I started to see the great depth of my sin and the importance of knowing I'm a sinner. God started to reveal it to me in mighty ways. I've come to see sin in all areas of my life, not just in the main few sins I saw before, but also in my thoughts, my motivations, and everywhere else. Actions can be easy to notice, but thoughts and true motives can be hidden. Jesus speaks throughout the Gospels about how our motives and thoughts are just as sinful as our actions. Matthew 5, 21 through 22 says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother is liable of judgment. You think, okay, have I been angry with anyone in the last week? Maybe, but it's more than that. Or how about has anyone answered... Has any one of you answered someone with an attitude? Parents don't look at your children. Well, I guess we do it too. Has any one of you thought about telling someone off? Has any one of you answered someone nicely, but in in your head you weren't so nice? Have any one of you told someone else what somebody did to you and then got them angry at that person as well? All of it is sin. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, is full of examples of how our attitudes and motives are sinful and how it is almost impossible not to sin in those areas. For more examples, you can go to the Ten Commandments. I've heard a few sermons on them lately, and trust me, you've broken all of them three times probably in this past week. They are not just about what you shouldn't be doing, but they're also about what you should be doing as well. Even our greatest and best works, the good things we have done, usually are tainted by sin and pride. Brady and I have a paper out. And I was doing the papers for a little while recently, and someone needed a sub for a day. And so I said I'd do it. So the paper people brought the other person's papers to our house so I could deliver them. I did that, and then the next two or three days, all of our papers went to that other person's house. So I'd have to get in the car, run over to get them, and then bring them back. And so, okay, I was a little bit irritated the first day. So I'd call in and say, okay, they should have never got our papers. They never did our route. Why are they getting our papers? Oh, yeah, we'll get them over to you. Okay, so the next day I get up, they're not there again. So this is an inconvenience to me. So actually, I'm getting a little bit irritated. Um, I'm getting with, angry with these people because they're not... Uh, bringing the papers like I thought they should. But then I thought, as I was angry with these people, I thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity to show these people God's grace. They're doing something uh, that I don't like, and um, it'd be great to show them grace, and they don't deserve it. And then I was running along, (laughs) and then I was running along, and I started thinking, boy, it's really, seriously, boy, it's really nice of me to show them grace. And maybe if I call them and talk to them, I could actually even tell them about how the grace of God and how nice I am being. And after I saw that when I was running and what was going on through my head, I just had to stop and laugh. I mean, that is how our sin, um, even some of our best motivations can turn into sin and pride can take over. So much of our good deeds are even motivated by selfish desire. You see that seeing myself as a sinner has really changed how I see others. The judgment and self-righteous behavior are less because I know I'm not but better. We are either equally guilty or um, I am much, much worse. And when you see the depths of your sin, 
that is definitely how you feel. It's this depth of my sin is way greater than I ever could have grasped. It comes to, comes out in my good behavior and my bad. It's in my actions and my motives. The depths of this pit I can't see. I understand all too well why Paul says what he says in 1 Timothy 1.15. The saying is a trust worthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the foremost. The woman that we talked about in our passage who was a sinner saw the depth of her sin and it made her desperate. The desperation brought her to a place of running to her Savior no matter what the cost. She did not care what others saw about her or if they'd shame her. Her desperation called, called, caused her to boldly go to Jesus in faith. Knowing the depths of our sin makes us desperate as well. We're desperate to be saved. We're desperate for grace. Now, if you're like me, uh, please don't try to not work at being desperate. Maybe you wouldn't, but I would. If I heard a preacher say, we need to be desperate, I would try to be desperate. I don't know how I'd do that. but So don't do it. Trust me, God will bring you to a place of desperation without you trying. It will come through trials with our family, our relationships, our spouse, our kids, our jobs, through sickness, financial issues, and definitely through sin, and much, much more. When we are at a place of desperation, we need to do as the woman did and run to Jesus. Now, also the purpose knowing the depths of our sin makes us desperate for the gospel. Tullian Tivetian says, you and I will never know Christ to be a great savior unless we first understand, our, our, understand ourselves to be great sinners. We will never feel, feel deliverance if we don't first feel desperation. We'll never experience the glory of real freedom if we don't experience the grief of our own slavery. So after understanding ourselves to be a great sinner, we need the gospel to show us about a great savior. The subject of the gospel is Jesus Christ. The object of the gospel is you. This is important because it locates the gospel, the good news, outside of you, which means you can do nothing to earn it. Jesus came to earth to die for our sins, to transform you from death to life, to bring you from darkness to light. The gospel is something we desperately need every day. Almost every morning, I preach the gospel to myself, so I'm immediately reminded of his grace for me. The gospel also gives us something desperately that we need, and that is forgiveness. The topic of forgiveness, even though it's a major point of the passage, wasn't even on my radar as I was preparing this sermon. But Thursday morning at 2 a.m., I woke up out of bed and said, you don't have anything about forgiveness in your sermon. So I felt like God telling me that I should talk about it some. So I added it in Friday morning. Our sins like the woman who was a sinner are many, but God forgives them all, past, present, and future. His forgiveness is unconditional as well. By his grace, he chooses to forgive our sins, and he chooses to do it not after we try to clean ourselves, not after we try to clean ourselves up, but when we are at our ugliest. So if you struggle with forgiving yourself for something, just remember that Christ forgave all of us at our worst point, and all sin is vile to Him. Knowing the depths of our sin also helps us to know how much we have been forgiven. Look at the women, woman in our passage. She knew she was a great sinner, and therefore the forgiveness she was given felt that much greater. I know that there are many people that struggle with forgiving others. Some people have been through horrific things that I could never even begin to say that I would be able to forgive some of it. And the one way I would just encourage you is by asking God to help you see how much he's forgiven you. Then perhaps it will help you to be, for, be able to forgive someone else. Knowing we are a sinner helps us to know how great our forgiveness is. And I know some of you are thinking this whole time, didn't you hear last week's sermon? I'm not a sinner, I'm a saint. Now I agree with you wholeheartedly that in Jesus we are saints. The scripture says that. But I also see an importance of seeing myself as a sinner. Martin Luther used a Latin phrase to describe our state, this side of heaven. I'll butcher it, but it's simul justus et peccator means that a Christian is at the same time both a saint and a sinner. To me, this is even a greater example of God's grace and, God's, 
in the gospel, that this egregious sinner, because of what Jesus Christ did, is now a saint. What this shows me is that my good behavior and bad does not change how he feels about me. He loves me when I sin and when I help others based on how he sees me. My relationship status with Jesus does not change based on my behavior. It's not what I've done. It's what Jesus has done for me. Now this has completely changed my view of sanctification or growing in Christ. My focus is on my Savior because I know I need him as a sinner. My focus is on the gospel and not on my own behavior. My focus on what Christ has done for me and not my need to improve. We love God and others because he first loved us. My growth in him is simply a response of his great grace for me. Look at how the, how the woman in our passage responds. She loved, served, and worshiped based on what Christ had done for her. Now, I say knowing that I'm a sinner, but it's obvious that I don't stay there. In, in when I either see temptation come or I, I know that I have sinned, I, I quickly run to my Savior and know that I am a child of God and that he has forgiven me. And then just feel relief knowing how much he cares for me and loves me. In closing, I, I think this passage from Luke ends perfectly. Verse 50, he says, And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Peace is what happens when you begin to understand the gospel of grace. Peace comes when I, can no long, when I no longer have to focus on my behavior. Peace comes when I realize we are free from the demand to measure up to God or other people. Peace comes when we realize we are free from the judgment of God, ourselves, and others. In Christ, of course. Peace comes when you no longer have to be regarded or respected because he already regards and respects you. Peace comes when you don't have to be known or appreciated because he already appreciates you. Peace comes because Jesus was strong for me. I am free to be weak. Peace comes because Jesus was someone. I am free to be no one. Because Jesus was extraordinary. I am free to be ordinary. Because Jesus won for me. I am free to lose. Because Jesus succeeded for me. I am free to, free to fail. Now today, I pray that you all know this great grace and you can leave this place at peace. You don't have to strive for love, acceptance, worth, and approval anymore. You already have that. You're not what you have done or will do. You are what Jesus has done for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and I thank you for the great grace of which you've shown us. God, I pray that these words given today won't, uh, Satan won't use them for his purposes, but Lord, that it would be, may be all for your glory. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, just how awesome you are and how you show yourself to each one of us and how you walk this path, Lord with us. God, I pray if there, there's people that don't know this great grace and love and acceptance that you have for them, and they're still trying to do it through approval, God, that they would give that up to you, knowing of what you have done for them. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for your word and your love. I thank you for these people here. I pray that we would uh, leave knowing your peace because of what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.